Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this episode we're going to begin by sending a little bit more xenon, topping off the Mars transfer vehicle, and then I'll start cycling it out a little bit higher and doing some time warping, see uh, how far we can get without actually exiting Earth SOI of course. Uh, just uh, making use of the ion engines a little bit more. Uh, we want to send the fuel up now rather than later though because It'll just be harder and harder for anything to catch up with it if we boost up its orbit. Uh, so we'll do that. And I've also got some other Mars launches prepared. And I actually created a, sort of a sky crane thing to land base modules on the surface of Mars. But there's still a whole matter of poking things up. I haven't actually made the rover yet. I'll do that for the next episode. So uh, we'll launch a few things. We definitely need a rover. Uh, we need a lot of things, obviously. And my confidence in being able to land things close together on Mars is very low at this point. So I need more practice. After all, Mars has doubled the gravity of the moon and an atmosphere. And, you know, with the moon, I can do it. With the moon, it's not such a big deal to land stuff close together. I can do that. And w even within, you know, the 25 meters that we can hook stuff up with. But Mars, Mars is tough. So we'll have to see. All right, especially since we're not doing a fully propulsive landing, we're using the parachutes and all that business. Anyway, I say this all ahead of time because it's gonna be loud. We, we have a super duper, super heavy, super duper heavy, well, whatever, the, the, the biggest Sajita rocket here. So I'll stay quiet while its engines do its thing. So SAS on and ignition. And launch. Ooh, that's quite a. Oh, it's got a little bit of rotation there. We'll be sending some spare xenon tanks to to Mars as well. I think that would be prudent, having some floating around. I tasted. I uh, tasted. I tested some inflatable heat shields uh, during the live stream around Mars. If we go, if we approach Mars too fast, they seem to blow up. But if we go on a fairly slow cargo trajectory, like take 200, 200 to 300 days, it seems to be all right uh, to capture uh, Mars with one of those. So, and we have to use an inflatable heat shield because nothing else will fit in this fairing. It was a suggestion from Mikko that I create a larger upper stage. Of course, currently the logic behind our stages is that they are all the same diameter. In fact, even some of our HABs are the same diameter because they're based on the on the tanks. And that diameter has been limited by our transportation facilities. This is the largest diameter you can carry on trains and trucks and such. It's the same diameter that Falcon 9 is for the same reason, and also the shuttle SRBs, same reason. So, yeah, I, I, but ultimately I suppose we're going to have to come up with a larger system. I'm somewhat tempted to do a whole Saturn 1 thing, and core ignition. separation and throttle up. Uh, in other words, create a core that is basically a combination of these. Of course, that'll make it very heavy. Calculating the mass would be really easy, but uh, it ends up being really heavy. And that would end up being a 10.6-ish diameter core bearing set. So, yeah, that, that would be a big rocket, and, but its utilization would be low because of the way the tanks would be inside of it, there's a lot of empty space. Potentially cheap, um, certainly has been done before, but maybe not the best idea. Okay, separation and ignition, nozzle extension. Looks good, and they enable cross feed.
and shut down that's basically what I wanted all right let's head on out there well technically let's head on to this ascending node right there and then we'll correct a bit of stuff okay well 50 meters per second is a lot to do with these little thrusters so I'm gonna quickly pulse the engine This time I think I'll have the Sajita upper stage try and dispose of itself first. No, uh, no, let's see. We'll see. I won't prejudge it. It's 122 meters per second here, but of course once it lets go, it'll have more, but I don't know how much it'll be. Let me just unlock this fuel and separation. Okay, uh, it's not got to be in... Oh wait, our periaps is still low. What was I thinking? Of course it can. All right. Well, I'm aiming to get real close here. Deliberately trying to get that close approach distance nice. Don't know if that's a hugely brilliant idea given some of our previous passes, but we'll see. This camera's not making me happy. A little bit late on this burn. Okay, closing in on the dock. Okay. All right, transferring the xenon gas. All right, well, there's a little bit that we can't transfer. How's its methane and oxygen doing? It's got, it's got some. <laughs> it's the best I can say. Okay, well, let's deorbit this fuel delivery tug. Ah, uh, it doesn't have enough to deorbit anymore. Mainly because I deorbited the Sajita upper stage. Well, we can at least get out of this orbit. We basically have a choice between deorbiting this or deorbiting the Sajita upper stage, but we can't do both. Okay, it'll probably mess up this node that I've got for Mars right now because we're doing it so early and it won't understand. But I think if we just do the burn here repeatedly, just on this stretch, we can get a little bit of it done. I, you know, might be a few meters per second here and there, but uh, it could be something. But let me jot down the delta V that the current maneuver requires, and then we'll see what happens when we boost it up. We're not planning on delivering anything else to this. Everything else we'll send separately. So this tri trip with this will be a test of the lander and also of the vehicle in general, of course. Um, yeah. We'll see how it works out, how the Delta V situation works out. But yeah, let me try a few passes and I'll come back to you after that. We've got 141 days until the actual transfer needs to be made and 128 days until this um, carbon alarm clock window. We can start launching stuff ahead of this, obviously, and we will. Okay, so a single pass. Uh, cut down the delta V requirement by about 17 meters per second. And I didn't actually get down what our stated delta V was before that. This time I will and I'll do one more. And we'll see. Unfortunately our burn orientation isn't the greatest for actually getting sunlight right now our panels are sort of covering each other so we're not getting as much power as I'd like for the ion engines they're not really able to hold full power they're about one-third only so yeah we're not getting all the bang for our buck okay so after that pass 
we lost 22 meters per second of stated delta V down here and we got basically the same so it's I wanted to check whether it was inefficient to do it like this right and it doesn't seem so it looks like we get about the same reduction in the planned maneuver and let me just check that it's actually getting to Mars or whether it's trying to fool me because after all we're in a eccentric orbit now and it likes that less and less eventually it'll make a mistake in plotting this Ooh, uh, it looks like we're arriving in 400 days that's a long time isn't it oh well but that's uh, 400 days not including our current uh, 137 days before the burn okay the trouble is if we do this with uh, Kerbals on board they'll have to hang out here for an extra 137 days or 140 days then we'll have to have extra supplies for them if they do. They'll be outside of the radiation belts, so that'll be fine. But, you know, unless we, you know, only get the crew up, like, right before it breaks Earth SOI, but that'll take a lot of Delta V to do that. So, we'll have to think about this strategy, but let me uh, continue for a few passes just so that we get this down to a more reasonable level. I don't want to do a 1895.5 meter per second burn with the methane and oxygen. I don't even know if that's possible. Let's let's quickly see whether it can be done. So, we've got methane and oxygen in the back here, a full tank of that. Uh, the rest is locked. It's mostly in the lander. I've detanked the lander as much as possible and we would use these engines and these uh, this tugs engines okay and then we can shut down the xenon gas so that we'll be pretending we're not even touching that it's a thousand eighty six meters per second that we have of methane and oxygen and I definitely don't want to use all of it uh, yeah so <sighs> give me some time okay so I've done some boosting here and if we take a look I'm already in an orbit that's past the moon's orbit but it's such a long orbit it's a 16 day orbit that either we go on the next round you know actually exit the system or we wait one more originally I think we were waiting one more but I'm more in favor of just getting this out there now and so I'm going to add this new alarm for this new maneuver and what it's going to do is we're going to get uh, do 585.6 meters per second and you know a lot of that's going to be methane and oxygen and we're flying by the moon a bit uh, just a little bit and it's at 20,000 kilometers and I guess that helps a little bit not a whole lot uh, but we go out and we have to do another correction here of 1456 meters per second that was gonna happen anyway uh, so we boost up even more and that allows us to use the ion engines for that part and yep then we reach Mars <laughs> so after that correction so altogether about 2000 we did some burning with the ion engine, about 700 meters per second worth. Again, the ion stuff works a little bit differently than your normal chemical propulsion. This number is not indicative of how much. You know, I mean, this would all have taken much less actual delta V if we had done it with a chemical engine, but because we have to take so long to do it, the numbers work out a little bit differently. So uh, always. Imagine that the 10,000 means really 5,000 or something like that because we have to do all these funny maneuvers like that one. And then also around our apoapsis, we'll probably start slowing down with the on engine by boosting our uh, our orbit so that, uh, well, yep, that would be part of the plan. So that once we actually arrive at Mars, we don't have to do a huge burn in order to capture, otherwise we're basically screwed. So right now, as we pass by Mars, let's see how much it takes to capture. 2,350. So yeah, this is going to be tough. This is going to be real tough. 
boosting our orbit up at the apoapsis will help that out, but our inability to plot really long burns hampers us in this case. Anyway, we'll go with this plan, but let's launch something else uh, in the meantime. Whatever we launch, because of the insulation on the Sagitta upper stage, it could hang out for 16 days if necessary, or however long it takes to get a optimal transfer to Mars. We can't really check it from this orbit because this is a weird orbit. But yeah, we'll see. That is why we're launching it without crew first. Of course, we're going to end up with more ion engine delta V than is displayed here because we're going to use up about half of, well, half of the delta V provided by our methane and oxygen engines during the exit burn here. So we've got that going for us. All right on to a launch. I've got so many things to launch I don't even know which one I'm gonna do. Okay our first launch is probably the lightest one but it is critical. It is the scanner, the resource scanner and we're not gonna be able to do anything with ISRU unless we scan for resources first so here we go with this ignition and launch Whoa! Just a single stick Sagitta rocket should be sufficient for the scanner. Of course it has to use its own propulsion to make orbit around Mars and that could take quite a bit. But we're packing like something like 16,000 in total. Hopefully it's gonna be enough. Okay, getting ready for staging. Separation of ignition. Oh, I've got the RCS thrusters on here. Gosh darn it. And fairing set. Just a very tiny thing. I guess we'll have to use these RCS thrusters. Oh, uh, it does have a reaction wheel. So, okay. I guess we're saved for, by that. So, correct ISP. We can throttle up, I suppose. I get the antennae out just to make sure I don't forget. Now the description said these would be enough, so I'm hoping there's still enough for Kerbalism, right? We've got some power. I hope that's enough. It's a big question mark. Okay, about to make orbit. And orbit. Alright, well. 4,035 meters per second left in the stage, then 3,600 uh, 3, in the probe itself to make orbit around Mars. The right orbit, of course, we need a polar orbit. Alright, what does MechJeb have to say about whether we can transfer now or whether we have to wait a little bit? It's got insulation on it, so waiting 16 days probably shouldn't be a problem. It'll boil off some. But it won't boil off too much, I think. So let's say ASAP. Well, ASAP takes the entire stage. That's doable. Um, what what if we just wait one orbit? Uh, I don't know if I can coax it into giving me that number. Well, that's within the budget for this stage. gets us there in 330, basically the same time as the Mars transfer vehicle. The transfer is pretty consistent because that's where the ascending and descending nodes are. So that's why it's taking so long to get there, but that's not a problem. As long as we can check and see that it's not going to take too much to make orbit. We have 3600 up there. Basically, that's what we can do. Hmm. Well, maybe we need to try something. Maybe we'll, we should send a backup. We could send the backup to Phobos and Deimos if it turns out we don't need it, but maybe later on in the cycle, closer to 
maybe after we launched the uh, Mars transfer vehicle on those nice blue splotches on the pork chop plot, we'll send another one of these. Anyway, we'll do this first. Well, the reaction wheel is good enough to point us at the node and everything and at the sun while we were in orbit for 13 hours, but it can't really, well, if we wiggled enough, it would be able to settle the fuel down, but uh, the reaction wheel is not powerful enough to settle the fuel down even by wiggling. So, um, staging the RCS thrusters on the probe and RCS on. Well, at least we know that the probe's RCS works. Now, is it strong enough to settle the fuel down on this? I mean, these are really tiny thrusters, 45 Newton class. Then again, the RCS I normally put on this stage is uh, 100 or so Newtons each. 400 Newtons altogether when actually trying to sell the fuel down. This is There's just two of these RCS quads. And so that's just 90 Newtons. We'll see how they do. I've given... Oh, it's, it's working. Well, RCS thrusters are not doing too badly. I mean, look... Uh, better than ion engines. Okay, let's try it. Oh, too fast. E Oop, oh, it went by. It went by. <laughs> I saw it. It went by. Okay. Um, it, I think it... No, that's probably just the plot. Okay, that's what we've actually got going there. I'll get rid of the orbital burn. Um, yeah, I guess we can just dump this stage. Oh, it's out of fuel anyway. I throttled down exactly when it ran out of fuel. All right. Um, so yeah, separation. Okay. Hopefully this burn is not gonna lead us to hit our former stage. Looks like it's mostly a normal burn, that's good. Okay, let's check if this little thruster works, if I uh, correctly configured it. Let's find out. Well, I mean, it wouldn't show Delta V otherwise. Ooh, its flame is weird though. Not quite as low as I wanted, but I guess we can fix that when we get there. So let's get the definitive results. We do a little bit there. We can get it somewhere like that. Maybe a little bit tighter. But anyway, something like that. Okay, so we'll get that maneuver into curve alarm clock. And we have our first, oh, we have our first mission to Mars on its way. So, but we're going to have a pretty busy window with a lot of Kerbal Alarm Clock alarms. Let's get the next one up. Okay, next up is a USI Pioneer module that we're going to try and land on the surface of Mars. It's got supplies. It's got about 180 days of supplies, including the nitrogen for pressurization and lithium hydroxide for CO2 scrubbing. And it has uh, space for two Kerbals, technically but we're not saying the Kerbal's along, this is just a test. It's got full shielding, and uh, the Pioneer module is lighter than some of the other modules, that's why we're sending it first. Um, the heaviest one, I think, is the Kerbitat module, um, and compared to how USI usually is, uh, I scaled the dimension up by 1.6, and the overall mass by 2.56, assuming a square of the, of the diameter. And that's because we're assuming that it's just the surface, the outer surface area of it contributing to the mass. So yeah, um, I don't know if that scaling is great, but in any case, it's reasonably well. It's not reasonable. It's actually pretty light, to be honest. Um, but it's heavy enough. Let me put it that way. Especially when it's got the supplies in. Uh, the dry mass of the pail is 8.8 .8 tons. Okay, so I, I don't feel like it's it's a bad deal. Anyway, let's get on with it, and then I'll talk more about it along the way. 
SAS on, throttle is up, ignition. Sajita is super heavy as you can see. And launch. The Sky Crane is one of my own devising. It is based on the ED5 engines previously introduced um, just recently. ED5 engines being uh, Methalox engines that are gas generator and uh, producing oh, about 48 kilonewtons, except these are actually um, downrated in their chamber pressure. They only produce 36 kilonewtons each. And uh, I in turn gave them more ignitions because the decreased chamber pressure should allow for more reignitions. The goal is for the Sky Crane to land the module on the surface of Mars and then get itself back into orbit around Mars. That's not going to be possible for the Kerbatap, but for this module I'm hoping it is possible. It depends on what kind of mid-course adjustments we need to do along the way. So I did add the Kerbalism modules to the USI modules, otherwise, of course, things would not work out very well. And uh, we'll wait until the, excuse me, we'll wait until the fairings are off before um, we take a look at that, because right now it's inconvenient. So this is a test of the landing system, but if it so happens that it works and the Pioneer module lands, we could eventually try to send Kerbals to it, but again, landing things close to each other on Mars is difficult, can be difficult. I have not ever done that, I have never landed two things close to each other on Mars, so this will be a first for me as far as, so expect a lot of, you know, head to desk basically. Same for the ion engines. I mean, this is the only the second time I've tried to do a transfer with ion engines. It's a totally different thing than your normal maneuvers. So, it's like learning maneuver nodes all over again or something. It's very different because of the way our maneuver no nodes work and they're instantaneous, whereas the ion engine burns are manifestly not instantaneous. And I know about Principia. <laughs> you don't have to tell me about Principia. I just can't deal with the lag and the overhead on that, especially since we're going to be l launching so many missions that it's going to have to keep track of. Just on this window, we're probably going to be trying to launch a dozen. I don't know how KSP 1.6 is going to take that, but yeah. Hopefully this version of KSP is going to be okay with that, we'll see. Okay, separation of boosters. Okay, um, now you'll, I was thinking about fairing separation, but maybe we'll wait. You'll notice that the USI modules start clipping into the fairing. I've tested that, it seems like it's not a problem, uh, but that is a bit unsavory. The decision to scale it by a factor of 1.6 is sort of a realism overall standard. Basically the 2.5 meter tanks become 4 meter tanks, and the 2.5 meter pods become 4 meter pods because that was the size of Apollo, 4 meters, really 3.9-ish, but... Um, so that's why there's that scaling, 1.6. So basically, instead of 1.25, 2.5, 3.75, and 5, you get 2, 4, 6, and 8. Um, but the, clearly, this Pioneer module is a bit more than 4, because that's a 5-meter diameter fairing, interior diameter fairing. So poking out. I added extra stabilizers here, these wide landing legs, because I'm pretty sure I'm gonna try and tip over on Mars, probably. And there's my uh, Sky Crane. Sky Crane Alpha, because I'm not 100% sure about it. 
Oh, you know what? I think I might have forgotten comms. Uh, oh no, I, I take it back. It's got good comms. My mistake. I was like... No, I, I guess I integrated it. That's sort of cheaty. Uh, I, that's actually an accident. I copied the configuration and modified it from my own tugs. The tugs have a little antenna on the top, if you ever noticed. Um, this does not actually have an antenna model on top because I wanted a docking port there, potentially. I'm not carrying the docking port right now because there's no need, but... Um, yeah. Okay, separation and emission, nozzle extension. Okay, everything looks good. Make sure this is not getting its fuel drawn. Nope. There's a lot of things in the way. So, obviously we're using an inflatable heat shield to capture. We were in a really bad orbit. I was talking away and not paying very close attention. You know what, let's just shut down and coast. Okay, that will be enough, and we certainly have enough for the transfer. Again, this is one of the lighter of these um, Pioneer mod no, one of these modules. Uh, it can't control itself. Oh, it does also doesn't have its own antenna. That's a little bit inconvenient, but yeah. Anyway, we'll see. Well, we have the fuel, and that's why I decided to launch it now, because obviously we're a suboptimal time for the transfer window. We're taking more fuel than we ought to, but that's a good time to launch the stuff that's pretty light. Oh, uh, only three minutes to the node. Let's get prepared. So other than this, I mean, we've got all sorts of stuff we need to send. I want to send some tugs over. The tugs are really the best way to carry methane and oxygen anyway. And um, want to send ISRU units. But with the scanner there, we might because uh, we don't wait two years for that business. So ISR units, all of this stuff will have to capture around Mars first and then pick a landing spot. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Oh, incidentally, these uh, conformal RCS thruster blocks are exactly the same as the thruster blocks on this. Same thruster blocks. It's just that those are covered up. Well. Using this stage to do the transfer burns is sort of the opposite of an ion engine stage. Okay, well I didn't see a little pass happening. Let's see what the situation really is. And if we go forward, okay, it looks like uh, we need a little bit more. I was reading The Faded Sky by Mary Robinette Kowal uh, just last night and it turns out that uh, the Mars mission she has going in that book takes about 320 days to get to Mars too, which is not you know normal for a Mars mission to take that long, especially since that one is going, I mean, with crew, uh, the cargo can take a long time, but crew usually they have them take like half a year, but instead it's, it's going slow and uh, even though it was sent there on an S4B instead of like ion engines. So I found that interesting. It is beneficial to get there slow. It makes it easier to capture. So um, polar orbit with this, it'll certainly afford us a chance to land anywhere. I guess that's not a bad thing. Oh, and I didn't even mention what we might be sending for Phobos and Deimos. Might be easier to land bases on those, of course, but well. Anyway, we'll see. We have to test all the things after all. Okay, let's do this burn then. Okay, things seem to be properly recharging. We'll have to see about whether there are any failures. I mean, I I don't know if there are ever gonna be any failures on my parts because I haven't added a particular module from. Kerbalism for that, and maybe they're just not configured for having failures. I might have to add that module at some point for realisms. But then there are a lot of other parts here that are realism overhaul parts that, in theory, the Kerbalism RO configuration should 
handle failures on those, but I'm not sure. Well, okay, the rest we'll have to do when we arrive. Probably it's gonna get thrown off anyway. Um, let me add a maneuver for that. Okay, and let me just tell it to face the sun right now. Sun down. It's a pretty big maneuver, but still, I put insulation on the tanks, and in theory, the 40 layers of multi-layer insulation should keep the boil off to only 10% for every six months. At least on my stuff, that's true. I did the calculations in the rocket science series, so hopefully it's not going to be too bad on the trip. And of course, boil off doesn't happen when we don't focus on vessels anyway so sort of a academic concern even if uh, the stage didn't have it left over the, the sky crane would and it's got full insulation it's got like a hundred layers I think okay so it's facing the Sun properly I'm gonna have it do the persistent rotation thing I had the scanner probe do that as well and yeah it should be good I uh, we've got the comms so we don't have to redo this and I think I'm gonna launch some extra xenon gas I'm very paranoid about our main mission the Mars transfer vehicles xenon gas situation whether it really has enough probably I should have added an extra one of those big xenon gas tanks so what I figure is we'll launch, we'll try to launch some extra xenon gas to Mars. See if we can do that. That's an important capability for us going forward. So yeah, uh, we'll make that the last launch of this episode. Okay, so this is adapted from our xenon tank refueler that we sent earlier on the, in this episode, but it's only half full and that's just to give us extra margins. We'll see how it goes. It's also got a heat shield. And I'll show you that business once the fairings are off. But anyway, ignition. We're launching immediately after the previous mission. That's why our relative inclination. Uh, we're lined up with the moon as I usually do. And um, yeah, that's why we have this relative inclination. Otherwise, I'd have to wait for 24 hours. Why are you rolling? Stop that. Well, one downside is on the previous launch we had a very nice sunset, but now we just have Venus over there. <laughs> not not quite as scenic. Okay, core ignition. And booster set. Alright, and fairing separation. So, here's what we've got. We've got the half-filled Xenon tank. We've got the tug. Uh, one docking port. Because obviously we would, whoops, we would need that if it actually wants to deliver it to anywhere. And then the, the inflatable heat shield, right? So... And then, of course, solar panels, we need those. And the tug has integrated uh, integrated comms and still a dish on top. Hopefully I haven't forgotten anything. Well, this time I seem to be getting into a very, very tight orbit. Which will be good, because this stage is going to end up in orbit, I think. Unless we cut it just short. Okay, we'll, we'll try and deorbit it. And separation. A bit lopsided because of that, but anyway, we are in orbit. But uh, 3684, we might get a chance to see whether this tug can actually use its main engines while that heat shield is attached to one side. Not sure. I probably should have waited another day for the transfer. Maybe I should just do that. Because, I mean, there are better opportunities here. <laughs> um, well, we have to actually target Mars. 
I mean, ASAP, we get 4,000, but just a little bit of a wait can cut that down to 3,637. Well, that's 33 days. I take it back. That's not a little wait. It looks like really we should be launching most of these after we do the burn with the Mars transfer vehicle. Maybe next time we'll start off with getting that out and then do the rest of this business. Because if you take a look at all these departure times, it's like 25 days on through 50 days, right? Really, the sweet spot is over here in 34 days. Okay, anyway, but uh, yeah, we'll just uh, see if this tug can actually use its main engine. So I'll, I'll plot uh, ASAP. And on its own, we'll have to see how much Delta V it has carrying that tank. Probably a fair amount. I mean, it had more than 1,700 with a full-fueled xenon gas tank, so should have a fair amount. But then again, we wanted to make orbit around Mars and still have enough to rendezvous with our Mars transfer vehicles, so need to watch out for that. Anyway, uh, note in 12 minutes, let's get the solar panels out. Hopefully I place this in the balanced way. <laughs> Hmm. Seems good. Of course I used RCS build aid. But then I tend to change things like uh, I think when I used RCS build aid I had the solar panels on the top and I moved them to the front to better counterbalance the heat shield. Not that they would fully counterbalance the heat shield but you know just a little bit. The little engines do have gimbling technically so I don't know if the, how well that will help them compensate, but maybe. And of course it has RC, the rig has RCS as well. We'll see. Obviously if it doesn't work, we're gonna... We're probably gonna launch other ones of these anyway. And we may make modifications as necessary. Okay. And let me just throw it down first. And separation. <laughs> Yeah, we need to control from here now. Yeah, before we do that, let's see how ignition works and whether it's balanced enough or not. Keep it low. Pitch. Well, it's wobbling, but it's uh, it's holding. Uh, it's using a lot of RCS. I don't. I definitely don't want to throttle up here. There is throttling. I think maybe it'd be better for me to plot this. At least we know it can work. We want this in a flat orbit because our Mars transfer vehicle definitely will not be getting into a polar orbit. Ideally we want to be in the same orbit as Phobos and Deimos. So this side. 500 is a lot um, but we'll do it. We'll do it. I think it's more than it was supposed to be. It probably will take some time. Please tell me it's not going to be horribly off. Oh, there it is. Okay. Well, we'll have to do a correction when we get there, as usual. We seem to be recharging, so I'll hold there. Okay. I have data from previous Mars attempts on... I mean, the important number is the mass on a heat shield area and its area it doesn't matter whether it's carrying a blader or not in this case this heat shield does not carry a blader so it can't deal with really high re-entry speeds yeah, it certainly couldn't deal with earth re-entry but Mars has a thin atmosphere and we're not going to be going that fast especially not on a 330 day entry so uh, I did try it on a faster entry uh, a 140 day trip that it did not survive so we need to be slower than 180 days to use this thing basically and uh, yeah in this case that should be fine and yeah the important thing is the area this provides which is substantial versus the mass of the vehicle and then I have numbers on how deep into the atmosphere to go depending on the speed at which we enter Mars SOI so all that's been written down hopefully that data will be consistent 
But for now, this along with the rest is departing Earth SOI and we will add that node. And so next time, I think I'll start off with the Mars Transfer Vehicle getting it on its way and then proceed to launch more missions over to Mars and there will be plenty of them. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time.